Hello, everyone. I am uh, Claudia Murgan, the uh, host of the Spiritual Inspired Podcast, and my uh, guest today is Thomas Legrand. Um, holding a PhD in ecological economics and having studied international development, political science, and management, Thomas works in the field of sustainability for UN agencies, private companies, and NGOs. His focus is on forest conservation, climate change, sustainable finance, and organizational transformation. His spiritual journey began at the age of 23 with an encounter with native spirituality in Mexico before embracing the wisdom of a wide range of traditions and practices, including meditation, energetic healing, and Tai Chi Chuang. He lives with his wife and their two young daughters near Plum Village, the monastery of Zen master Thit Nhat Han in the southwest of France, his native country. He's the author of the book, The Politics of Being. Thomas, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. Thank you, Claudio. My pleasure to be with you. So I would like to start by taking you back in time when you were 23 and I mentioned the, the trip to, to Mexico. What exactly happened? Uh, a lot of things, I guess. Um, what well, was funny, I was, I was telling that story to a friend uh, recently in that uh, uh, when I was uh, I was a student in France at that time, and I had this opportunity to do student exchange in Mexico. And while I was on the metro, there was someone who was reading uh, Carlos Castaneda's book. It was called uh, um, The Art of Dreaming. And I saw that looked like a, a great title. And, uh, and then and I had a, also a teacher at that time who were a bit uh, talking about drugs and trips. And he was mentioning he had a... Uh, an initiatic uh, travel in South America when he was younger and say I was reading Castaneda, etc. So I buy uh, I bought that book uh, as I was going to Mexico. And uh, uh, during the first months, I, I've read it. And uh, so, wow, that's the craziest thing I've ever read. And then I ended up uh, a few months later uh, with uh, chamans who were uh, practicing to some degrees, you know, uh, this kind of uh, Toltec uh, Mexican shamanism. So, and when I connected with them, I instantly recognized uh, the same day. I remember there was a night where we did a ceremony, and the same night, I said, "Wow, I need to go back to Mexico to uh, learn from them." And uh, I think that's what I'm looking for in life. So uh, then I, I prioritize uh, my own uh, inner spiritual journey. Uh, as a result of this connection with uh, uh, these chamans and especially this, I would say, reconnection to uh, Mother Earth. Yes, I mean, that book is pretty wild. I, I was blown away by uh, by the content, especially the, the last part, and uh, it's uh, quite unbelievable. You have to have a strong heart and the open mind to to absorb those concepts and um, everything he mentions there, uh, defies the, the the law of physics pretty much and everything we know in the normal life. Um, so yes, you have to have a, an open mind. And while in Mexico, what type of uh, medicine did you, did you use? Um, in Mexico, well, I, I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, in Mexico, I had these uh, encounters with uh, different shamans that were somehow connected to each other and to some uh indigenous cultures uh which uh, funnily enough you know the the main uh chaman was a doctor also so also quite modern in some way uh and uh he found out that what he found in these uh, traditional cultures in these teachings was somehow a little bit with a little bit more cultural layers but at the same kind of concepts and myths that what you found in Carlos Castaneda's book, such as uh, the, the the warrior's journey, uh, you know, Tonal, Nawal, uh, all these diff all these um, uh, worldview, if I can if I can use that word. Uh, but yeah, and they were uh, working indeed with some uh, plant medicines uh, like the Hikuri or uh, Piyuti, um, and I I. I spent some time with uh, with Charles, which are indigenous people in Mexico, uh, working with that uh, medicine, this cactus that you 
found in particular in a in a, in a sacred desert in Mexico, uh, Wilicuta. Um, so I spent some time, and I spent some time also in uh, the the mountain of the south of Mexico, where uh, especially women uh, chamans use uh, mushrooms or Niño Santos, uh, so that would be saint children as they call it, uh, for uh, medicine. No, and uh, I think when uh, when I when I went there. Uh, I remember someone said, you know, so you're coming here to uh, to heal yourself. And I said, well, I'm not sick. Or <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, taking it, you know, at a very uh, physical level. Uh, but uh, yeah, I did uh, I did connect with this uh, plant medicines, these teachings, and uh, yeah, that was really uh, um, that really inspired me to. Uh, prioritize my own uh, journey. I think I found, as I said uh, uh, in my book, uh, to me it was, it says it's very important that a, a warrior finds, a spiritual warrior finds a struggle that is uh, that is worth it. And uh, and somehow this uh, path of the spiritual warrior really resonated with something very deep in me. And uh, I don't know, I remember even before going to Mexico, I remember uh, I was in a in a concert of uh, uh, how do you say uh, digital music? Uh, how do you say uh, electronic music? Electronic music, yeah, yeah, with the Chemical Brothers, and that was an, a, a, a a very uh, a wonderful concert. And I, I remember saying to a friend, "That's something of a warrior," mm-hmm. and he told me, "Well, there's something strange when you when you." When you speak that word, it sounds strange in you. So I, I really feel that very soul connection to this, uh, to the warrior uh, archetype, I could say. Yes, I mean, you're, you're very lucky to uh, step on your spiritual path at an early age, 23, uh, because some of us don't, don't do that even when they are, when we are in, their, in our 50s or 60s. So at 23, you are quite <clears throat> lucky to find that path and, uh, you know, discover it, go deeper. Uh, and in fact, you went back to Mexico and spent three years there. Am I correct? Yeah, 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 exactly. I had to, this was a student exchange. So I needed to come back to finish my studies for four months in France. But uh, yeah, I had only this idea just uh, to, to get back to it. And then uh, I, uh, funny enough, I did an internship at UNESCO just after ending my study. And the first day, my supervisor mm-hmm. at UNESCO said, hey, uh, I may have a consulting opportunity for you uh, in Mexico (laughs) after your two months internship. So that's how I I get back to Mexico and just found more work there and uh, and live for three years uh, and try to to learn as much as possible from this uh, tradition. It's interesting how the universe works uh, in our favor when we want to to focus on specific uh, development. And because you uh, work and you lived in, in Mexico and among indigenous uh, people, it's very interesting that they always adopted a sustainable way of, of living. So why don't you think that we, at a large scale, want to learn from them and apply that uh, way of treating nature and treating ourselves? Yeah, definitely. I think to me that was a very important uh uh inside uh the how much we have to learn from native culture in particular uh to their link to uh mother earth and uh you know even this concept of mother earth you know we really uh they really consider uh themselves as you know part of a larger organism and the children of mother earth that we need to to treat with uh respect and um and to me, is that also to recognize that the Earth is itself a living being, uh, and uh, and it's an organism. And um, somehow, often indigenous cultures talk about the rivers as the, the veins of uh, like a, it's, it's basically like a human body, right? The rivers can be the veins, and even uh, you find in some cultures uh, how different continents. Uh, has to do with different organs have a, a function of themselves energetically into the earth's uh, body. And there is even medicine for yeah. taking care of the earth, for nourishing energetically that body through uh, ceremonies. And there's uh, some work also I, I've been involved uh, into it. And um, 
And to me, that's really important. And that's why uh, we have nowadays also a proposal to recognize uh, the rights of nature, uh, whether the rights of Mother mm-hmm. Earth per se or the rights of, of specific uh, rivers, species, ecosystems, etc. cetera. Uh, it's because we consider uh, it or them uh, living beings who have their own rights to, to be, right? Yes, and, and that's the, the, the main issue. I, I just finished reading uh, Nature Spirits by Susan Raven. She lives in uh, Wales and she's an amazing song uh, writer as well. And she talks about the souls of <clears throat> every single stone or a patch of wood or the um, gnomes and every single um, spirit which uh, takes place and takes care uh, in nature of a particular uh, place and we have to come to to that place with with reverence i said it many times in in my interviews um we don't ask permission to enter a a forest we just go in Uh, we don't take a moment to thank the ocean we just dip in you know so there are small gestures of uh, recognition and appreciation that we should make it part of of our um, way of living Yes, def- definitely. And um, as you said, no, you know, there are spirits that take care of certain places, right? And through ceremonies, uh, we are told that we are indeed nourishing uh, the, the, the force that uh, they are, uh, you know, managing. So we are nourishing this spirit to take care of, the, uh, of these places, right? And uh, in, uh, in my book, Politics of Being, I even... Uh, tell a story about how I met in a in dreams in dream uh with some of these uh uh beings uh you know as we as I was in Madagascar I was in a in um doing a trek in Madagascar and reaching up the top of the mountain at some point and uh there was a tree with all with lots of banknotes and you know I was uh tired and I I did not think too much and I tried to to laugh and 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 and, and take the the bank notes look at and uh, and then the guy come came in and uh, and say uh, no you don't have to do that he just put it back and and, and did a prayer etc and uh, at night I realized that in my dream I had a spirit uh, uh, making fun of me and trying to bother me and uh, at some point I woke up uh, I was in the middle of uh, of the forest and the other guys are uh, uh, were not with us anymore I was only with a friend. And uh, and uh, as I was tired, I knew I would sleep again and, and, and get back to this uh, uh, dream space where I could uh, interact with this uh, spirit. And uh, somehow I had a lucid dream uh, when I got back to dream, and uh, and uh, and I actually actually met that spirit, which was all dressed in red, like uh, uh, chamans in Madagascar have told me, you know, is a traditional color. And uh, and I had an interaction uh, with him uh, that was uh, really uh, really wonderful. No, I, I remember very well, you know, their, their interaction. And yes, how much, they can uh, turn a- against us if we don't uh, <clears throat> behave. And one, I think, the most well-known spirit is Pele in Hawaii. And uh, Hank Wesselman uh, wrote at length uh, about it, uh, about the spirits uh, of Hawaii in his uh, book. So uh, this is I, how I came across and I wrote, I took that concept and I mentioned in my books as well. Um, because the experiences he had, the profound experiences he had while going down the volcanoes in Hawaii uh, were quite unbelievable. And he tested them pretty much with his um uh practical mind over and over again just to be sure that his mind is not playing tricks on him so it's the spirit of the place who affects us in different ways yeah and um that's why myself even i i do uh, a lot of work in uh, in different countries with uh the UN, for example, and each time I go to a place, the first thing I do when stepping into that land is to, uh, you know, pay respect and ask for for guidance, for instruction, for being of service uh, to the spirit uh, of the land. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. 
So since uh, Mexico, you transitioned to other spiritual perspectives like the Zen um, approach? Yes, um, I think, you know, even in Mexico, I, I just started to get interested by spirituality per se. Let's say I, to me, uh, there was a lot of... Uh, of freedom and openness uh, in uh, in these traditions I found in uh, in Mexico. So I, I started to be really interested how different uh, cultures have connected to um, to you know the spiritual life. And uh, at some point later on, so I was back in uh, uh, when was that um, 20, uh, 2013, So ten years later, I mean a lot a, a lot happened. I, I practice a lot also of Tai Chi Chuan, energetic healing, uh, etc. And I, at some point, I found uh, meditation. And in 2013, I first uh, came here where I'm living now uh, to Plum Village, which is a monastery of Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. And uh, which, you know, felt like really I was um, guided there. And somehow it was meant to be somehow because the first time uh, the first day I met my wife, uh, a woman who become my, my wife in 2009. And she said, oh, you're coming from France. There is a place I like to know in France, which is called Plum Village. So and uh, then in 2013, when we when we went there, I could feel already uh, even even before going, you know, there was something waiting for us. And we arrived there. And six months later, we, we just came to, to live here. And uh, and to me, it was a completely um, turn down from uh the spiritual warrior path, which I found also uh, in myself some limitations uh, to it. And uh, I remember once being in Plum Village and, and someone had a book in his hand. And I just I just catch a sentence was written and um, just got a sentence was written on the book. And it says, if you make your past a struggle, then it's not your past. No. So <laughs> <laughs> so that was really a completely a complete shift somehow from this uh spiritual uh warrior perspective and i find to me uh really a uh, medicine for my soul in uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's, uh teachings especially you know the emphasis on on joy on ease uh so which is reflected in that sentence so have you had the chance to interact interact with the master uh yeah uh a little bit uh so when we went for the first time to Plum Village, indeed, uh, we arrived, I think, on Friday. On Sunday, there was this gathering of the different hamlets with, uh, for teaching with Thich Nhat Hanh, but which started with this uh, famous song about uh, Avalokiteshvara, the, the, the Buddha of compassion. And somehow, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh guides uh, this song and he was doing some... Um, some uh, gestures and um yeah i realized maybe uh almost half of the people of my group uh just cried <laughs> uh just touched by and, and i could feel you know the power of the energy that was involved in this chanting uh, and yeah then uh when we were there i mean the day we decided the day i was telling my boss that i was quitting my job to come to live here uh i mean no rather the week that's when uh, Thich Nhat Hanh had a stroke. So uh, I had to, to check with my wife. Are we still sure we, we, uh, we, we're we going? And uh, he said, yes, so there is a, the community. There are the teaching, the practice. So yes, we're going. So then we had uh, the, the interactions we had with Thich Nhat Hanh was uh, he, after the stroke, he could not uh, talk anymore. So there was some uh, silent interaction uh, and... Uh, yeah, which are very personal and, you know, it's uh, very subjective somehow. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, I, I really, um, I mean, the Thich Nhat Hanh passed away uh, last year on January 22nd, which was the day my book, Politics of Being, was launched. Uh, so uh, it was a very uh, important day. And uh, as, he, as he passed away, I reflected also of, you know, I have been so important in my life, but at the same time, you know, we we never uh, probably spoke uh, directly, right? Mm. So, uh, but, but yes, there are some very meaningful interactions in the in the, in Plum Village and uh, and also uh, you know things in dreams, uh, etc. Yeah. 
Thank you for sharing. And that area is also known, it's close to the Pyrenees. So it's also known as the Qatar's uh, area when they lived 700 years ago. And uh, I have another guest from that area, uh, Sophia Anaya. Uh, so um, <clears throat> she's from UK and she lives there. And she mentioned about the potency of, of the land and the, the spirits in, in, in that part of France. Yes, indeed. And there is, I think there is a very strong uh, sacred feminine energy. Uh, we say in general in the southwest of France, there have been a lot of uh, apparition, like in Lourdes, you know, of uh, Mary. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, and the Qatars have been also a very interesting uh, movement of spiritual renewal uh, movement uh, in the Middle Age. Yeah, uh, that I feel connected to also. Yeah, Thomas, I would like to switch now towards the the work you are doing in you know sustainability, climate change, and everything we mentioned in the introduction. Um, and you know, I've been a proponent of humanity's increased consciousness for a long time. I mean, all my books mention this direction, and it seems that those in power are doubling down on their broken policies and blunders instead of admitting their mistakes and trying to fix them. Are they lacking an ethical and spiritual compass? How do you see this aspect, especially that you are involved with some of them? Sure. Well, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, we uh, more and more recognize we are uh, in a systemic uh, crisis. Uh, somehow all our institutions which uh, brought us here seems to long no longer be able to cope with uh, the challenges of the of the 21st century uh, i think covid right now has been uh, very helpful in terms of uh, really making space for like we cannot uh, i mean i'm working for example with uh, united nations development program and other development agencies and geos some companies uh, around sustainability issue. And I think there is a, there has been a, a video recognition that business as usual will not do and we need to look for innovative approaches. Uh, we need to work more uh, with a view of systemic change. Uh, and um, I see more and more this agenda around um, consciousness, more and more visible. Uh, I'm leading myself an initiative uh, within the United Nations Development Program, which is called the Conscious Food Systems Alliance. So people find uh, already amazing that a UN agency use this kind of uh, language around consciousness or, and we are partnering with some of the best scientists that are positioning this agenda, including for example, uh, Christine Bamsler, whose work is uh, quoted in the uh, IPCC report. So uh, now people recognize that, you know, um, to address climate change, we need uh, also to think about uh, they, they mention inner transition, you know, in people's life, in people's individual life. Uh, they mention, you know, the uh, change in values, etc., uh, and the change in mindsets. And more and more, uh, you know, people I'm working with recognize that uh, we need to work on this change of mindset. Um, in, and we are partnering, for example, with another initiative that is called the Inner Development Goals that are making the claim that to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals, we need to develop certain hum inner human uh, capacities and skills. Um, so I, I think this is getting uh, very quickly traction, you know, as we look uh, collectively into the change that needs to happen for the uh, ecological climate transition, uh, we start to realize, you know, how deep it is and how, you know, how difficult it is. And, and that helps us touch that, okay, well, that's, uh, you know, not only a technical change, it's, uh, it's a change of civilization. It's also a cultural change. Um, so I think this recognition is, is growing very quickly. Um, I go even beyond that, that, you know, people recognize how, the inner dimensions are important to achieve, you know, sustainable development goals, sustainability, etc. Uh, in my book, Politics of Being, I go even one step beyond that, is that actually uh, this is a real human development. So, uh, you know, we have, and mentioning that our main development paradigm has been very 
until now has been very materialistic in terms mm. and we have been uh, measuring mainly um, countries' progress by uh, the economic production, GDP. Yeah, the GDP, right? yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And, what I, and this reflects of a whole worldview, a whole uh, culture, some called the story of separation with some values around materialism, individualism, uh, reductionism, anthropocentrism, etc. And uh, in my book, Politics of Being, uh, I, I think uh, I've researched for 10 years, you know, what is a wisdom-based approach to development? And I come to the conclusion uh, that is mentioned, you know, the Earth Charter say, when basic needs have been met, human development is primarily about being more rather than having more. So politics of being is about prioritizing being more and how our institutions can help for that, how our societies could be organized for that, including, you know, our education, health, governance systems, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, um, yeah, just moving forward based on uh, concept of GDP is not um, sustainable, that's for sure. And uh, is the program you are working on trying to attract people from outside the UN, such as Vandana Shiva, which is very vocal on both on a spiritual side, and she understands that aspect of a human being or a culture, and the sustainable agriculture for, for India, because she is, again, a, a very good um, figure to, to talk about this and bring some feedback to, to the program and your work. Sure, sure. We are. Um, so this is an alliance. It's convened by UNDP, but uh, you know all our members are coming from different organizations and different parts of the world. And uh, we are, you know, we have just been launched in uh, at the end of last year, uh, and we are uh, in the process of engaging her and her and our organization. Yes. Okay. And yeah. together with other. Um, you know, uh, leaders in the field of especially agroecology, regenerative agriculture, you know, how these, uh, and, you know, highlighting that a lot of these agroecological movements are based on a different worldview, on a different set of values, etc. So we need also, if we want to support that transition, we need to work on these inner dimensions. Okay, and how is this tying into, let's say, one of your uh, chapters in the book, which is called, I think, um, One Government or World Government or something like that? I can't remember exactly. How is your vision uh, of, of that? I think you're referring to a chapter that is called One World. One World, and sorry. A, yes, yeah. And the <clears throat> following chapter is called Many Nations. So because, and maybe I, I have to say a little bit more about uh, this concept of politics of being, um, and uh, to mention that I say spiritual values are the foundations of the politics of being. So I have tried uh, in my research to identify where are now the seeds of this new development paradigm emphasizing being. And I found that it, it them in different communities, uh, which are both scientific because uh, these values have become fields of scientific research in the last decades, but also uh, these community are proposing uh, um, agendas or initiatives for uh, social change. So I have uh, and I have one chapter in my book on each of them. So the first one is uh, about systemic, complex, and integral thinking. Uh, the second one is on life, like in the regenerative movement, which emphasize that we need to harmonize ourselves with how nature works and even organize our societies uh, mimicking how nature works. Um, another one is happiness. You know, it has been proposed as a new development paradigm also by uh, Bhutan, gross, gross national happiness. And we have more and more countries now advocating for a, a well-being economy, etc. cetera. Uh, the other one is love or empathy and compassion. Um, I mentioned, for example, the uh, the Charter for Compassion and many cities in the world uh, uh, proclaiming themselves compassionate cities and with uh, action plans around that. Uh, peace or a culture of peace there has been a resolution in the UN and a lot of work on that in the UN. Mindfulness, we know that uh, the science of mindfulness that emphasize all the benefits of this practice and how these can be leverage, leveraged 
including for uh, in the uh, for public policies. For example, there is a, a report in the United Kingdom as uh, championed by a, a group of uh, members of parliament, shall like the potential of mindfulness in different uh, sectors, education, health, business, justice, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, uh, to me, that is, you know, a progress of our society is actually cultivating these values. And uh, now we have ways, uh, and as um, identified by science, we know how to cultivate them at the individual and the collective level. So, and each of these uh, different communities have some recommendation about what this means in terms of public policies and systems in different sectors. So in the politics of, of being, I bring all of them together in a vision for a new development paradigm for societies. Uh, and coming back to what you mentioned on one world, many nation, I said that these values are universal. So, and, and being is something that connects us with one another because being is uh, interbeing, you know, uh, mystics from all different traditions have now realized that there is a fundamental uh, spiritual experience that is common to all of them, which is, some call it uh, oneness, unity consciousness, or uh, interbeing, the fact that we feel really connected with all that is. And because we feel connected, we of course want to take care of one another and take care of, uh, of the earth. Um, so this is really can be uh, this paradigm around being uh, can really bring ourselves together uh, while uh, the paradigm of having an economic growth tend to divide us because, you know, what you uh, have is something I don't have, right? So, uh, so this being agenda can be a way to unify humanity. And that's uh, what I talk about in my chapter on one world. Right. And uh, at the same time, each, as, as I was saying before, you know, each land has its own function in the uh, in the Earth's body, in the Earth's organism. And it's true also of nations, you know, which somehow uh, express uh, some of the, the qualities of, of that land. So each nation has also its own, each culture has its own connection to, you know, what is, uh, you know, the good life, let's say, right? And uh, and they tend to unlight uh, some of these values I've mentioned. You know, that's why maybe Bhutan, you know, because of its Buddhist background, will emphasize happiness, right? The end of uh, suffering. Uh, some that are more uh, maybe, you know, uh, coming from uh, the religions of the book may emphasize more uh, love or uh, et cetera, like the Charter for Compassion, for example. Uh, but when you dig into, into that, you find that, okay, you may enter through the concept of happiness, but then you touch upon all these different values I've mentioned. So it's just like each culture tends to emphasize and have its own relationship with uh, that, um, with being, or which is just an expression of, of the divine, right? Yeah. So that's why I'm saying also many nations. And that's a concept of unity and diversity that you find uh, in, in nature and in also so many uh, even constitutions like the EU or countries like Indonesia or many others. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful uh, concept and, uh, you know, I, I wish you luck in drawing the, the attention and the, the funding and the energy around it. But you mentioned something very interesting that uh, each land has its own power, his own energy, his own culture. And this is what concerns me and other people as well, that there is this forced migration of people from their own land to new lands. So when you come to the new land, you don't understand the, the local culture. You don't understand the power of the land. And you try to, or unconsciously maybe, you don't apply the same rules. You don't apply the same concepts and the same values. So then the traditions of, let's say, North America will diminish because now you have people from the South that come with a different type of value. So in Europe, you have people from Africa and Middle East coming with a different set of values. And those lands will remain depleted of humans, of resources, of intelligence, of energy, 
while others will be overcrowded with a multitude of energies and mindsets and traditions, and it will create chaos. So it's not a, we don't have a balance anymore. And I think this is, in my opinion, and based on what I listen to, to other people which are much more smart and much more um, uh, up-to-date than me, is that it's a forced intentional migration and this unbalance is created uh, with uh, malevolent intention. Do you see the same way? Um, I'm not sure. This is a, this is a, a very um, complex uh, issue. Um, so there is the question of uh, you know, people losing their tradition in relation to the land, in relation to sacred sites, etc., which is uh, probably happening in a, in a, in many parts of the world. Uh, at the same time, I would say that it's it's something that uh, because of its spiritual nature, it's something that you know can be rediscovered by uh, each generation, and I'm I'm confident that there is actually even. For example, in Europe, where we have been uh, a little bit, um, uh, our roots, our indigenous roots somehow have been um, uh, cut. Uh, I'm confident there are indeed uh, more people than we're seeing that could uh, tell us, you know, how to take care of the land, where are the sacred sites, wh what to do, etc. Uh, because, you know, you just, uh, you can receive that from uh, the world, the worlds of spirits can tell you it has happened to me uh, to, to tell you about some functions of the lands and how to do with it, etc. So I, I, I don't think the fact that you know traditions can be can be cut off is a, a major hindrance to uh, recover that knowledge. I'm also been very interested about people, for example, in Europe, bring, bringing some indigenous people from South America that have this strong connection to the land, etc., and they have been able to come. And, and tell us about, you know, about our own land and how to take care of it. Um, in terms of, uh, I talk about, um, in my book, I talk about nation soul. And uh, I've been, um, and some people have told me, you know, uh, be careful. It's a very uh, dangerous concept in terms of uh, nationalistic uh, um, claims, etc. And um I do think, uh, you know, that we need to to strengthen our connections to our our uh, cultural and spiritual roots in different cultures. Uh, but I, as I said in the book, also, uh, we don't have to take a, a very materialistic or reductionistic approach to this concept of nations uh, soon. Uh, and I, I often say, you know, you have some governments that, uh, you know, wants to um, a little bit recreate or, or and, and fossilize somehow this connection to a nation soul. Uh, and I, I take the example because it's always helpful to compare, you know, what happens at the collective level and what happens at the individual level. And I, I, throughout my book, I show that spiritual teachings can also apply to uh, the collective level. So I said, you know, if I want to become myself, which is, you know, being this agenda of the politics of being that being more, which makes becoming more of myself and a better version of myself, just simple uh, definition. If I want to become more Thomas, I will certainly would not define what Thomas is and then just try to stick to it uh, as much as possible. It's more like I will connect more deeply with myself and try to express uh, the uh, what's um, you know uh, my essence, you know, to express myself in the world in the in the way that felt that feels more authentic. Uh, and so it's an emergent process. It's not something that just can be defined uh, as some governments, you know, are somehow trying to do. So I, because you know, it's uh, I, I I do feel that these nation soul. And some people have, have a little bit of difficulties also even as a spiritual concept that uh, nations can have a soul somehow. It's a, a concept, for example, I've borrowed, uh, for example, to Sri Aurobindo, who talks uh, very mm -hmm. eloquently about that. Um, and I think these uh, nation souls 
do not necessarily relate to uh, uh, the fact that people are not coming uh, from uh, their ancestors who are not in that land. There's a dimension of that. But I think we need to, re to be uh, much more open as it's a, a spiritual concept. If I take my own country, France, uh, which is uh, famous worldwide somehow for culture, arts, etc. Well, this, which I think, you know, is somehow part, and, and I would say even the, um, yeah, the thinking part also. Well, a lot of the great artists that have flourished and that have expressed this uh, nation soul actually came from other countries. You know, if you take, uh, let's say, the, the, the painters around uh, Picasso in the 30s, etc. Well, Picasso was from, there was some coming from Spain, some coming from East Europe, etc. So this, uh, um, the energy which can connect to some values, some ideas, these are spiritual values and they can be, uh, and then, uh, and people from all over, all over the world can relate to it, can be attracted to it and can help it uh, flourish this uh, uh, national uh, soul or essence, let's say. Yes, I mean, we have Romanian um, writers and artists going to France and finding the, the right environment uh, in which they, they flourished. And some people, they still think that, uh, you know, Eugen Ionesco was French, but he was Romanian, but he flourished there. He mm -hmm. uh, was able to uh, become who who was at that time because he found the, the right environment. Um, so, so, yes. And, and talking about, you know, climate change, and this is a very delicate subject because uh, the powers to be switched from uh, climate warming to climate change and the result of back and forth. Um, <clears throat> I find as an outsider, you know, looking at uh, some news and uh, alternative media, there is a lot of um, hypocrisy in what they are saying. And they are applying this climate change concept only where they want to, for us to focus our attention. So recently at, in uh, Dubai, there is a conference on um, climate, I think, and Al Gore was there and you know he's a proponent of uh, this concept for, for many, many years. And he was very angry and very upset that people are not uh, paying attention to, to climate change. But at the same time, he never mentioned the ecological disaster that happened by the um, blowing up of the Russian-German gas pipeline, which his government helped to, to blow up. So that's an ecological disaster. And two weeks later, we had the uh, East Palestine um, cataclysm in uh, Ohio. And people have to move out. People will get sick. The land will get infested. The water won't be drinkable. And the government doesn't do anything. They don't want to talk about it. Media doesn't talk about it. So when you see this type of hypocrisy, what type of uh, base these politicians and credibility these politicians have to, to, to believe and talk to us about climate change? Yeah, I I was wondering, you know, who do you, who are they when you say, you know, they are? Uh, I guess they are uh, mentioning the governments, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So my sense is that the governments actually uh, lag very much behind uh, what should be done, and uh, in terms of climate leadership. So um, I I don't feel like it's so much. Uh, uh, so they are trying, I mean, of course, uh, they have to recognize that, uh, you know, climate change is a real uh, issue and we need to um, to address uh, to address it. It's a major uh, threat for uh, the future of humanity. Um, it's a major uh, transformation. I personally believe that it has to come uh, together with uh, a new development paradigm, uh, as I said, you know, politics of being. So, so there is such a profound reorientation of our uh, societies. And I mentioned, you know, the um, inner transition of individuals, you know, many of us at some point in life, you know, change 
uh, what we prioritize in our lives, etc. And I think this needs to happen now at a global level and at a collective level, right? Uh, we need this really profound reorientation from adding economic growth to uh, being or collective flourishing. Um, so, but it's that is why it's so difficult to do, right? Uh, because right now, the way the system works, uh, especially ar organized around economic growth, to say uh, it's simply, uh, is a major hindrance to uh, tackle seriously uh, the climate crisis. And for many reasons, somehow, um, governments are, um, you know, part of the systems uh, and are very... Uh, have a lot of difficulties to let go of that old systems and and shift uh, or uh, development trajectories. So uh, they still need to to do something. And uh, what you mentioned um, is, I guess, you know, the importance of not uh, separating the climate crisis with a broader ecological crisis, uh, because uh, you know there could be this tendency even. If you look at the UN convention, there is one convention on climate change, there is one on biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. So, but more and more we recognize that, you know, all these crises have to, uh, are going together and we need to address them uh, in an integrated manner, right? Uh, so we can't, you know, uh, the same, you know, we can't uh, have climate policies that, that go against uh, biodiversity. You know, if you just want to, do carbon sink, let's say, or uh, with uh, only uh, reforestation of monocultures, well, it, it will uh, certainly have a, an adverse effect on biodiversity. Uh, but I, I would say even, you know, recognize that this is also a human crisis. It's also a cultural crisis and, and which are evolutive crises. So that are crises that uh, are inviting us to this major uh cultural uh transformation i said that cultural transformation is of a spiritual nature because as i've said it is about expressing these uh higher values and it's about really getting in touch with our spiritual nature uh with, and, and the fact that we are deeply interconnected uh at a material level but also at a spiritual level yeah, I totally agree with, with you. And if I may uh, uh, say something, hopefully you'll agree with me. So your book, Politics, Politics of Beings, is not politically correct. Am I right? Um, that's not what I, I would not define it as not politically correct or politically correct. But I, I would say at least it's a, it's a very different uh uh, view. Uh, I was looking for a spiritual approach or wisdom-based approach to development. So, uh, and my main uh, surprise while I was uh, writing that book is that it, it seemed to me so important to articulate that new perspective on development. And I was very surprised that uh, there was no book like that uh, at the moment. And the fact that I was building on something that has been said in a very important document the US Charter, which said development is about, it's primarily about being more, and nobody figured out, you know, what this means, uh, both theoretically and in practice. So that's what I wanted to offer with this, with this book, and it certainly is a very different uh, look at our, you know, our, our social uh, potential. Yeah, so let's <clears throat> promote this concept as much as possible. Um, Thomas, uh, we are approaching the end of the, the interview. Any final thoughts? Any final thoughts? Well, um, I I invite inviting people, you know, to connect to to my website politicsofbeing.com. As you will see, it's uh, there is a lot of endorsements of major uh, political and spiritual leaders. So I think it's a very uh, and uh, and people find it as a, a breakthrough in somehow uh, that is able to bring this kind of spiritual insights to the mainstream uh, discussion on development, politics, sustainability. So uh, I invite every people to, to get familiar with, uh, with this reflection and, and, uh, and to, to connect together to, to move this agenda forward.
Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, we we need uh, to bring uh, spirituality more into the business, more into political, to uh, bridge to to bridge that gap as you you mentioned, and uh, have a more ethical way of of living and dealing with uh, with each other. Thomas, thank you very much uh, for your time. It's it's been quite a pleasure. Thank you, Claudio. Great to be to have this time with you. Spend this thank time you. with you. And uh, to my guests, thank you for watching, like it, share it, um, check uh, the politicsofbeings.com uh, website. You're going to find more information there. Um, get a free copy of my book when you visit uh, my website. And until next time, love and gratitude. <laughs>